Hi, this is Tony Preston. You can find my content at integrativeworks.com. If you're on YouTube watching this, hit the like and subscribe button. You can also support this work on Patreon at Integrative Works. This presentation is about musculoskeletal illustrations that I have created for body workers. This started a while back. I was a teacher. There was an assignment in the class where students would draw the 25 muscles that cover the majority of the surface of the body, and students complained. I said, listen, this is simple. You just get some skeletons, print those off on paper, and you can draw the muscles on them. They still complained. So I said, I'll go through and draw some of these muscles with you. This is a copy of my first drawing, trapezius. This brought something alive for me. You can see that trapezius is attached to this blue column. And from that, it reaches out to the green platform and acts like this hydraulic mechanism that moves that around to support the movement of the upper extremity. I like this, and as I continue to do these illustrations, I like them more and more. So I thought I would do more illustrations, and I began to study illustrators. If you're watching this, you probably have a copy of Netter's. His work is very accessible. It has this balance between being cartoonish and realistic. If you don't have Netter, you probably have Sabata. His work's a little flatter, a little more cadaver looking, but very detailed, especially on bones. And I, I, I like his work a lot. I also studied the work of Criche, which was a, a French artist who did a fantastic job of drawing muscles as you would see them through the skin. It really beautifully done stuff. And of course, as a person who does trigger point work, I looked at the work of Barbara Cummings, who drew for the Travel manuals. Her works also was very well done. I began to study them so much that I would see differences in their style, how they serve different people better. And of course, I begin to look at the more, uh, the old stuff like Grey's Anatomy and the more contemporary stuff um, like you might see on Ken Hub or some other uh, site out there. It gave me lots of ideas. It gave me perspectives on uh, how each one was useful and kind of what it's made for. I noticed that the, the style, each style served a group and I was looking for a balance between simple and clear that really helped out body workers. So. At this time, I was a body worker and I was making a transition from being a sort of a heavy, uh, muscular, neuromuscular, deep tissue sort of person to where I was doing more uh, subtle joint work and that sort of thing. It was important to me that the work supported those people that I was teaching and other people that were just trying to learn I was doing active isolated stretching at, uh, at the same time, and I noticed that in this particular stretch here for glute max, that, that it created this pain in the fold of the hip in the front, and that if I simply gently held the ilium so that it moved a little posterior on the sacrum, it changed that trigger point, and that muscle released, and the stretch worked better. I humbly present to you my work, and let's move on to a simple example Infraspinatus produces a common problem that body workers are dealing with, which is this sort of pain in the front of the shoulder when you're trying to sleep. Okay, so here is the scapula. And here is the humerus. This muscle originates on the scapula and inserts on the humerus. And let me take a second to talk about origin and insertion. I get that it's a convention that really, we really just have attachments. And sometimes that point of attachment is an origin or insertion is based on the movement that we're doing. However, in this context and in learning them, because of the, the motion that it implies, it's important to use this. And I even use it a little bit on ligaments where I, I show how those pelvic ligaments are strapping the lower extremity onto the axial skeleton. So let's get back to infraspinatus. Infraspinatus is a three-bellied muscle uh, with a tough membrane on top of it, kind of like gluteus medius is. 
the upper two bellies attached to the top of the head of the humerus and a little bit higher than the third belly does. That trigger point that disturbs sleep is in the top belly. I noticed that I could, uh, while the person's face up, slip my hand up under the scapula there, place my finger on the trigger point, and gently ease back the head of the humerus, and I could feel that trigger point soften and release. So I really began to work with a self-evidence process of learning how to release trigger points with joints. Not only did I find that it lasted longer, but it also was much easier for the patient and easier for me, even if it only softened the trigger point to make it more responsive to deep tissue work. Let's move on to another example. Let's talk about biceps. Biceps traps the humerus. So biceps originates on the scapula. It uh, originates on the supraglenoid tubercle. It originates on the coracoid process. It skips over the humerus and it attaches to the radial tuberosity. It has a couple of sets of trigger points in it and those trigger points up near the shoulder that produce that strip of pain along the front of the shoulder, they seem to be released by working the glenohumeral joint and especially moving the humerus a little inferior in the socket. The trigger points on the other side of biceps produce pain in front of the elbow and those trigger points seem to be more responsive to mobilizing the radial head. It tends to be a little uh, posterior and a little superior and once it begins to release that forearm begins to rotate a little bit better and those trigger points release. Let's move on to another example. Let's talk about triceps. Triceps, like some other multi-belly muscles, has this combination thing going on. So it originates on the infraglenoid tubercle of the scapula, crosses over the humerus, and attaches to the olecranon process of the ulna. It also has a couple of bellies that attach directly to the back of the humerus, and then attach to the ulna as well. So that humerus ends up not just being an origin or a trapped bone, it ends up being a combination. So through these illustrations, when I have something that I've illustrated in teal, it means that this bone has more than one thing going on. And this gets a little complicated and controversial in this idea, especially when you get into muscles on the posterior spine that cross over several vertebra and attach to several other vertebra. So you, you might be talking about something like splenius cervicis that that comes off of those uh, thoracics, you know, wraps around the neck, attaches into the top couple of uh, vertebrae in the upper cervical. So th this idea gets a little more complicated in those areas. Let's take a look at some of that sort of stuff. Uh, let's start talking about string diagrams in the erector spinae. Here's a typical illustration of erector spinae. They're shown as this kind of bundle of muscle that's held into place by the serratus posterior muscles. And so we have you on that uh, lateral edge, that sort of bright orangey red uh, iliocostalis. And in the middle, there's that bulky, darker red um, longissimus and up against the spine is spinalis. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit more about iliocostalis. Let's look at that illustration of iliocostalis lumborum. Okay, in the bulk picture, it's not very helpful if you're looking for work with the joints or understanding the details of the attachment. It does tell you where the bulk of the muscle is located. Well, it tells you generally where it's located, but it's mixed in with those other pieces in there. So this illustration, however, gives you a good idea of what this muscle does and where it's attached. It attaches to those lower lumbars, to the sacrum, to the pelvis, and then it comes up and attaches to those bottom six ribs way out on the lateral angle so it's got some leverage there to do some 
uh, lateral trunk flexion. It's got some leverage to do some extension of those ribs, which are pretty flexible. Certainly we would want to do more of the extension of the spine over on the longissimus where things are a little more solid, but this gives us that ability to pull those ribs. So, you know, it's, it's involved in heavy breathing while we're bent forward. You know, I can see why a cyclist would have trouble with this and we can kind of see more about how it works. Let's transition over to the thoracic section. Look how that thoracic section kind of attaches to those lower ribs, just where iliocostalis lumborum let off, and the thoracic section then goes up and attaches to those upper ribs. Okay, so now we've extended up. We now have this center piece that acts as an extension of the lower piece that helps to move the ribs a little bit further. And of course, let's go ahead and transition on to services. And now we can see how services picks up there on ribs three through six and skips over the top ribs and the lower cervicals and attaches up there in the mid cervicals at uh, C3 through C6. Now we've got something that extends the neck from the ribs. Let's put all of these on here together. As we transition into a, a picture that shows all of them, you can see how those bulk pieces on the side don't give you any real idea like the string diagrams do. These, therefore, I've put string diagrams in some places in my illustration so that we can see how these pieces link up. Now, there is some argument about when you have three or four vertebra that it attaches to, are those origins or are some of them trapped? And I'm leaving them as origins at this point. But I just want to say on all of this, if you're on YouTube or you're on my website or you're on Patreon, I would love your comments. I'd love you to go out there and tell me what you think about this and what I could do to improve it. There's one more illustration I'd like to show you. This is a rendered view of psoas. As we look at this lateral view, there's something really fascinating about it. You can begin to see how that posterior belly of psoas attaches to L1 through L5 and then wraps around that pubic bone and hits the greater trochanter. And at the same time, you can see how that anterior belly attaches to T12 through L4. So there's that little split between the bellies and it comes down and blends in like an upside down SCM and also, of course, attaches to that uh, lesser trochanter. Okay, this is interesting. You know, th this view of it begins to show a lot more about how that psoas levers across that pubic bone. It also begins to show us more about uh, how it pulls a little more forward on L5 in that posterior belly uh, as opposed to that anterior belly, which ends at about L4. At the same time, we can see that this muscle traps the sacrum in the middle and of course if we were to include iliacus it would end up bringing that in as an origin point as well so if we're talking about the entire iliopsoas there's a little something different happening than if we're just talking about psoas major but those relationships become more evident as we look at different illustrations here there are other things out there take a look at the website i'm tony preston and you can find this on integrativeworks.com We'd love your support. You can find us on Patreon at Integrative Works and on YouTube at Integrative Works. If you're on YouTube, again, hit the like and subscribe. Thanks for your time.